Joining us now is Gabe Karp, partner at Detroit Venture Partners and author of Don't Get Mad at Penguins and Other Ways to Detox Conflict in Your Life and Business. Gabe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Good morning. Yeah, good morning to you as well. Appreciate having you on the program. Uh, so first off, can you just give us a little bit of your background uh, and, and how you got into uh, your, your current work, how you became an author. I understand you began your career as a trial lawyer. Yes, uh, that was a long way away from where I am now. But um, yeah, began my career as a trial lawyer. Uh, never planned to go into business or anything like that. Um, I was a litigator, so I was in court quite often. Um, did a lot of commercial litigation, which is uh, what I call business divorce. Um, and also some legal malpractice work. So our firm was the suing other lawyers for screwing up, which if you think about a lawsuit being contentious, those lawsuits were super contentious. Uh, but it was great. It was great training. You know, I mean, imagine cross someone who cross examines people for a living and who hates you. Uh, and you, you just, you learn a lot about anger and how the energy can flow in a room and in a dialogue and how to, uh, you know, at the time, if someone was angry with me, I tried to get them even more angry. I tried to get them as angry as I possibly could because it would just work to my advantage. Um, and I was a litigator for about 10 years and then left the private practice law and joined a small startup, which, which was a whole other story that would take too long to get into now, but joined a small startup, maybe about 20 people or so when I joined, uh, and we grew um, pretty fast to over 500 people. And while I first started out as the legal guy, uh, pretty soon I was taking on lots of non-legal responsibilities, operational teams, you know, operations teams, and um, working with lots of leaders and helping grow other leaders in the company. And, and we started throwing off some cash, uh, so we started to look for other companies to acquire. And I headed up those efforts and did the M&A stuff on, on those. And then we acquire companies and integrate them. And throughout, throughout that entire process, throughout being a lawyer and then working in business, anytime I would look backwards, maybe six months or a year to try to inventory how I had been spending my time, I was always gravitating toward conflict. Um, it used to be I was trying to create conflict and mix it up and stir it up. Um, but then in business, I was seeking out conflict, rooting out conflict to figure out where the friction points were so that we could eliminate them and just be more efficient and grow faster. And um, the same patterns of conflict I saw in litigation were recurring in business and in personal lives too. So it wasn't, it, it, all. the only common denominator was human beings working with one another, dealing with issues. And uh, I, I started getting pattern recognition where I'd run into a problem and I'd say, wait a second, I've been in this situation before. It was different people, different dates, different facts, but it's the same structure of a problem. It's the same anatomy of the problem. And, and I started working on some tools uh, to resolve them. And the great thing is, is that, that the same tools that can resolve conflict in a lawsuit or in a, in a really difficult issue dealing with a client um, can be applied in any walk of life. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're in the, I say in the boardroom or in the courtroom or in the break room or in the parent teacher conference or the bar or the Thanksgiving dinner table with a, with a drunk, angry uncle spouting off about politics. It's the same patterns and the same tools. Um, and then we sold our company. Uh, it was a successful exit. And since then I've been in the venture capital, um, and working with, uh, the CEOs of companies that I'm on the boards of and seeing the same patterns over and over again. Only now I've got a pretty, um, pretty full um, portfolio of mistakes that I've made in the past. So, so I can see those patterns and CEO tells me that something's gone on and I say, Oh yeah, I did that. I screwed that one up really bad. So I can certainly tell you, don't do what I did. <laughs> maybe, maybe try this instead. And, um, it's just really interesting to me how all of these things um, kind of come full, full circle. And uh, again, same patterns. And I, I have sort of identified what I call toxins in conflict. And these are things that naturally occur in human interaction, uh, anger, fear, judgment, ego. 
and in the right amounts, those things are great. They drive progress. They, they cause us to fix things that are broken. They help us avoid problems. Um, but if those elevate too much or they get too low, they become toxic and the conflict becomes toxic. So I like focusing on detoxing the conflict and then taking the healthy conflict and leveraging it to, to drive success. Um, and if you think about it, probably any time in your life that you feel that you really grew from an experience or that you benefited from it, that was you working through conflict in a healthy way. Or maybe it, was, maybe it didn't work out well for you since you got from that, um, put you in a much better position to deal with a similar conflict in the future uh, in a far better way. So Gabe, when you mention good conflict, so often when people discuss the idea of a conflict being in place in any environment, it has this negative connotation. But like you said, there are certain kinds of conflict that can be very constructive in, in many different environments. Can you define what it, what, what is good conflict and how to recognize that okay, there's a conflict in my work situation, in my family situation, in my social life, but this is good. This can build something better in this relationship. Yeah, sure. Um, I, one premise to that question is that conflict is inevitable. And one of the myths out there, the common misconceptions is that conflict is a bad thing and should be avoided. So I would say anyone who tries to avoid conflict is trying to avoid the inevitable. And that usually makes it worse. When you avoid a small conflict now because it's uncomfortable, um, that will allow it to fester and grow and develop into a much bigger conflict uh, that's gonna hit you eventually. Um, so I, I would say this, most conflict comes from a difference of opinion or a, a difference in goals between people or groups or teams. And um, to me, that's a good thing to recognize those differences and to be able to work through them allows you to um, pick the best solution because no one person has all the answers uh, and everyone can benefit from a, a contrary viewpoint and the ability to hear that viewpoint um, to make your viewpoint known to someone who disagrees with you allows both sides um, to come up with something that has collective benefit for everyone involved um, so I, I, let, let's get specific. Let's say uh, there's a leader who has an underperforming team member on their team, and they've got some harsh feedback to give that person. Tell that person things that they is not going to want to hear because it's going to make them feel bad. Um, and as a result, the leader says, well, I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful. I don't want to hurt that person's feeling, feelings. So the leader withholds the feedback to avoid the conflict. But that's not avoiding conflict. That's just allowing someone who is doing something wrong or could be doing something better to improve to continue making mistakes. That's not respectful, that's disrespectful. That's mean. That's like actually a cruel thing to do to another human being. Take a really simple example. If right before I came on this, on this show, I was talking to someone and I had food in my teeth, like spinach in my teeth, and the person looking at me just didn't say anything and allowed me to come on here, like that'd be mean. <laughs> I, that's something I wanna know. So healthy conflict is, is the kind of conflict where a leader can sit down with someone and say, listen, we've got a bit of a conflict here, but I want you to be aware of these things so that, that you can improve. And if you improve, then the team improves. And if the team improves, the company improves and it's all good. And what can be difficult in, in the heat of the moment in a conflict uh, or, when, or in a discussion that can get a little bit heated because there is a conflict in opinion or a conflict in philosophy or certainly in, in, if there's a conflict in the perceived execution of, of something in a business sense, there can be this difficulty to take a step back, identify the situation you're in and try to find the best route out for everybody involved and identify what you, what you have marked as those toxins. What are some, what's some advice or some strategies that you have for taking that step back and identifying in this conflict, what are these toxins and, and how do we address them to turn this conflict into something positive like we just spoke about? Sure. Yeah. G great, great question. Um, as far as the toxins are concerned, it, there, there, there are quite a few, but I found that four 
account for the vast majority of conflicts that I've experienced and witnessed. Uh, anger, fear, judgment, and ego. Um, and when those things, are, when people don't have enough of them or they have too much of them, um, that that those are the toxins and they create the conflict. Um, but you also, at the beginning of your question, you touched on something that's really important. And that is in the moment, you know, it's hard because we get, we kind of get triggered inside, like we get amped up. And there are really good reasons for that. And it's very helpful to understand that. I mean, it's nature and nurture. Um, we're, we are socialized from a young age to shy away from conflict. Uh, we sugarcoat feedback. We soften bad news. We're, our parents told us, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That creates this sign that if we ever express a contrary opinion or openly disagree with somebody, we're kind of, um, we're going against, we're sort of violating the rules that we were taught as a child. So we just don't want to do that. And in addition to that, we've got physiological uh, aspects of our body that have developed over the millennia, you know, I mean, you're talking about billions of years of evolution uh, that have secured the survival and growth of the human species um, to protect against threats. And when we're confronted with a physical threat in the wild, uh, we have a fight or flight response. And that does things like takes our thinking offline. When you're facing, when our ancestors faced a saber-toothed tiger, right? when they came out of the cave, they didn't have time to think or reason. They just had to react, and it had to be instinctive and, and reactive. So great. But those instincts are still today. So when I'm in, uh, when I'm in uh, a, a, a meeting and someone says something and I feel maybe personally attacked or judged in a way, I'll start to feel the physiological effects of conflict. Like, the hair on the back of my neck will stand up. My breathing and heart rate may increase. And it, that, that are, th those are signs, those physiological symptoms are signs that something's going on and taking you into some toxic situation. So one piece of advice I have, and, it, it, and it, it's not like you can just flip a switch. You can't just turn that off. But what you can do is think about it in advance. And when that happens, identify the moment when you've got those physiological responses to conflict. And maybe at first you identifying it in real time, but you will immediately afterwards. I, I always tell people like, have you ever come up with the perfect thing to say in an argument only an hour after the argument ended? Um, and everyone says, yeah. And the reason is that uh, your access to the thinking part of your brain had been shut down during that conflict. So if that ever happens, think about think back to that moment because it won't have been that long ago and you can say you know what i kind of get a sense of how i react in those situations and the next time it happens and you say oh wait i feel like my breathing's getting rapid or i realize i don't like how this person's talking to me i don't you know i i, I don't feel as in control of my thoughts and my words right now if you can take literally just one breath and hold that space for a second or two, that's enough to disrupt that instinctive response and pull yourself into intellectual awareness. And that gives you power and control. And then there are a number of different tools you can employ to, to, to use them. But that first step is, it's not easy at first, but it's, it's not that hard. And if you do it three or four times, it like it, you, the learning curve is pretty sharp. So you get much better after your third time of doing it than you did after your first. We're joined by Gabe Carr, partner at Detroit Venture Partners. He's also an author author of the book, Don't Get Mad at Penguins, Detox the Conflict in Your Life and Business for Success and Happiness. It's uh, Don't Get Mad at Penguins and Other Ways to Detox the Conflict in Your Life and Business. More information on his website, gabecarp.com slash book. That's Gabe Carp with a K dot com slash book and so Gabe, i do, do want to ask you about the about the title don't get mad at penguins is the main title of this and, and it also has the subtitle uh, and other way and other ways to detox the conflict in your life and business but where does the origin Julie. yes yes where does the origin uh what, what's the origin what's the the purpose of don't get mad at penguins where does that come from well uh i i i think it's best to think of a saying um 
and I made this up, but I say it in a way that makes me sound like some wise old sage, but it's really, it's between expectation and reality is a space filled with suffering and conflict. And the wider that space becomes, the greater our suffering is. And the penguin analogy is really a lesson in acceptance. We should accept people with their limitations and all and not expect them to do things that they're not capable even though we may really, really want them to. And one of the challenges with that is that it's oftentimes really hard to see someone's limitations, especially if everything else we know about them suggests that they're not limited. So take a penguin, for example. Uh, what do you mean a penguin can't fly? It's a bird, it's got wings, it's got feathers, and birds with wings and feathers can fly, except that penguins can't. Flight is simply beyond their ability, despite the fact that everything else we know about them suggests that they should be able to. And we can choose to get mad at that or we can accept it. And that that analogy, you can apply it to interaction and people that you deal with on a regular basis. Um, and what, whatever the facts are, when you find that you are continually getting frustrated or angry or even fearful of someone in a similar situation over and over again because they're not behaving in a way that you want them to, it's very possible that that person is not making a choice. They're not doing it on purpose. Uh, the thing that you want them to do is beyond their ability. I'm joined by Gabe Carr, partner at Detroit Venture Partners and author of Don't Get Mad at Penguins and Other Ways to Detox the Conflict in Your Life and Business. Joining us on the Michigan Megacast. More information on his website, gabecarp.com slash book. That's gabecarp with a K dot com slash book. And uh, Gabe, if people are interested in picking, up a, in picking up a copy of Don't Get Mad at Penguins, where can they find your book uh, online and, and even in some stores? Uh, as my publisher says, it, the book is available everywhere books are sold. Um, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Walmart, Target, uh, Google. There's also an audio book uh, narrated by me. Um, James Earl Jones wasn't available. Uh, and and uh, that's available on Audible, audiobooks.com, Apple, uh, and a number of other platforms. Uh, so if, if you Google Don't Get Mad at Penguins, you'll see a, all the results you need to, to order it. And it's a, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a quick read. Uh, and I'd say it's a, it's a, a great investment for, you know, a few bucks. Uh, you can get some, you can get a new perspective on something you've probably been dealing with for a long time. Yeah, take a couple of the pieces of advice from Gabe in today's program and expand on that with a full book of that, of that sage advice. Gabe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.